Stephen Benjamin with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Production of IsraelReturns.com. I want to check out our new website there. It is certainly a blessing. Many things will be changing on that very soon. Uh, we hope to have us a home here before too long. I think we've come to some decisions. So it looks like maybe by November 1st, we'll have a house here overseas. And uh, we'll really be able to get more busy at that point there. But anyway, uh, just the other day, actually yesterday, in fact, I opened up the Bible to Exodus chapter 18. And I began to read this. And as I did, the Spirit of the Lord come upon me and really begin to unlock this beautiful passage, something that maybe even others have already realized and seen as well, but I wanted to share to you just the things that the Lord laid on my own heart about this. This is after Israel has been, they've gone through the deliverance of Egypt, after they have come through the Red Sea, after the murmuring of Mirabah, all these things that were happening there, the struggles that had taken place, and yet the mighty works of God. And finally, uh, we see in the story here in chapter 18 that Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, is going to come to him along with Moses' wife, Zipporah, and her two sons, or Moses, their two sons, I should say, Gershom and Eliezer. And this is the part I wanted to read with you and share with you, the things that the Lord placed in my own heart about this. It says here in chapter 18, verse 1, When Jethro the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, keep that in mind, he had sent her back, and her two sons, which the name of the one was Gershom and for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father said, He was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Keep that in mind. Another interesting point. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, come with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness where he encamped at the mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I thy father-in-law Jethro am come unto thee, and thy wife, her two sons with her. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare. And they came into the tent, and Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they de dealt proudly, he was above them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat and judged the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening." And, of course, the story goes on from there. Now, ironically, here, let me just share some things that are really interesting in this. One, Jethro offers unto God sacrifices. He recognizes God by his divine name, the yod heh vav -Hey of his, the very name of God of all of Israel. The, as it, some say, Yahweh. We know this is not the correct way to say his name, but the point is, is he knows God by the divine name of God's name. It also shows that when the divine name of God is revealed. Now, I'm not sure I'd have to go back and check on this, but I don't think that Jethro uses that name until this point. Which it also says in the, in the Bible uh, that God would reveal his name in the time when Israel would be compassed about with the world's armies. That's when he would reveal, he would restore a pure language unto the people. That they may all be able to call upon the name of the Lord. And he uses the divine name of God there. Now, 
Here's what I've always found fascinating. I've spoke about this before in time past. We know that Zipporah and, her, and Moses' sons, when he first is called to go down and to deliver the children of Israel, his wife and his sons go with him. Because when God first calls him, they go. But it's not when they first come down there to Israel, it is not during the times of the plagues. But it's during the time that as he begins to speak to Pharaoh, he begins to address, as we would say today, the Pope of Rome and the evils that he is doing to the children of Israel. That all it does is cause the Pharaoh to put more burdens upon the children of Israel. There's still no mighty move of God as of yet. But the works, you know, there's still, the, the, the serpent was turned to a snake, and of course the Pharaoh, he's got his own enchantments. And it doesn't the Bible say that in the last days that they will do great miracles, signs, and wonders, the, the false one there? And they even, there's all kinds of reports always about how this pope, this miracle, and that pope, that miracle. They even said about John, Pope John Paul II on Mount Tabor, there's a thing written there at that place that says that when, when Pope John Paul II come up, that he was transfigured like Christ, and that the people saw it. Oh, gosh. So the point is, is Pharaoh then, like Moses dealt with Pharaoh, and Moses swore before God in his own word there, when he sings a song, Asherah, let on I go, I will sing unto the Lord that I have gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. One horse, one rider. So Moses, whether himself or whether his, the spirit that was upon him that will come upon a man will return in this day and will defeat Pharaoh and his horse. And of course, it's the Pope of Rome. Obviously. There's no way around it. As much as people try to make Obama look like he's the guy that's going to bring about a one world religion, I mean, how ludicrous, how plain out totally mindless could that be and I mean good people really believe that Obama is an antichrist I mean wake up antichrist is like Christ he is a replacement he claims to be as if he were Christ when he's not he's never claimed that you know as much as people try to make Obama look like a savior Obama's never claimed that but yet the Pope of Rome has when the Pope himself sits and he wears that triple crown and it says vicarious filia dilia and it means, I, in other words, I take the place of the Son of God and you look somewhere else for an antichristo? Nonsense. People need to wake up and quit, quit going. I mean, you got all the mainstream religions pointing to the Muslim Mahdi because why? You don't have Christianity. You don't have the Bible for your eschatology. You're using the Quran for your eschatology. The very book that the Vatican wrote by a bunch of monks in northern Africa. And they raised up uh, uh, Muhammad. They took a Catholic girl, Kaji, who was faithful to the Catholic Church, had her marry him, a rich woman. He was enticed by her. And then he becomes Catholic. But the thing is, is what do they do? They create a religion for the Muslim people. Or excuse me, this time for the Arabic peoples. Why do you think that they have rosary beads like the Catholics do? Why do you think that they believe that Mary is a great woman in the Bible? Mary was a great woman. It does nothing against Mary at all. But now the Catholic Church, instead of a trinity, now they want to have a, a quadrity. They're going to make Mary a god as well. They, well, they've already made her one, so they might as well have themselves four gods. You know? God is a true, he is, there is a trinity in God himself because God has manifested himself in the fact that he is, he is, he is the Holy Ghost. He came down and manifested himself in the Son called Yeshua. He lived in that body. We know this, this is true. And so God is able to do that. He can do whatever he wishes to do. He can be what he wants to be. But now, back to this Beautiful passage here with Moses and, and Jethro. Let's go back a little bit and look at this again. See? Now Jethro, he serves the same God as Moses. Offers sacrifices. Aaron, the priests, every they come together. 
but they don't come together until after the deliverance. So this is one of the things the Lord revealed to me. Now, Zipporah was with Moses and her sons who represent the converts of the Gentile people that would believe the same God that Israel believes. She becomes one with Moses. She marries him. Moses is a type of Christ here. And now Moses is sent to deliver the children of Israel. But when he first comes, they don't even recognize him to be the leader. See? I mean, some do it the first. We know there's some, but immediately after, the, after Pharaoh began to put the hardships on him and everything, what do they say? They said, you make yourself a prince over us. Well, that's actually, I'm sorry, that's back in the very beginning, 40 years before that. But they still, you had that, you had Cor and Dathan always rising up against Moses. But Zipporah and her sons are with them. In other words, the church is with Israel when Israel is going through hardships. But when the time comes down, when the showdown will come, when the plagues will be poured out. Now, this is what's interesting. Nowhere can we find anywhere where God or Moses sends the poor back and his sons back to his father-in-law. We don't find it biblically. Where is it at? It's a mystery. So it's the same thing when the bride goes. It's a mystery. You don't know when. All you know is that when God will begin to bring the judgment by the two witnesses, the bride will not be here. Because it seems to be that sometime before judgment began to fall in Egypt, that's when Moses sent his wife and sons out. It's just like with the story of Joseph. Joseph, right before he reveals himself to his brethren, he dismiss dismisses all the Gentiles. So his wife was included, no doubt. But yet, from Pharaoh's house, they could hear the mourning and the weeping of the Jews that were there with Joseph as they began to recognize their brethren. And so will it be. There will be a bride somewhere that will hear from the very house of God. They will hear the mourning and the weeping of the children of Israel according to Zechariah's promise as they begin to weep and mourn as a family that killed their only son. Or lost, you know, they lost their only son. They didn't kill it, they lost their son. The death of their only son. The Bible says they will look upon him and they say, where did you get these wounds? He said, in the house of my friends. The very ones that he loved did it to him. So anyway, Zipporah, Jethro brings them back. And when does he bring them back? After everything's over, after Israel's delivered. And then it is, what is it? Jew and Gentile sit together. What did Yeshua say? I will not drink of this cup and I will not eat of this bread until I, again, until I do it with you in my Father's house. This isn't just with the Gentile. This is with Jew and Gentile. He was speaking to the apostles. And what do we have here in this story right here? The Jew and Gentiles come together and they break bread and sacrifice together. Mm. Jethro and Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, verse 5, came with his sons and his wife and Moses into the wilderness where he encamped at the mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, Jethro, come unto thee and thy wife and her two sons with her. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and they came into the tent and Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and to all the travail that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. You see, the Gentile is not there when Israel is going through this particular... The Gentile is there when Pharaoh has turned against them. So you will see the Pope of Rome, as he's doing now, making life hard upon the Jews. Like the sanctions. Notice that. The sanctions. What did Pharaoh do? He put sanctions on Israel. Go gather your own straw. We won't give you no more. What do you think's happening in Rome right now? Rome has caused the European Union, the United States, and all the nations that they can, can control. Unless you go back to pre-1967 borders, we will sanction you. Go get your own straw. 
There will come a time, though, that God will send the two witnesses when he's had enough. Just like Moses and Aaron went together before Pharaoh. The time will come when he will no longer, he'll be done with it. And then the plagues will begin to pour out. And we'll see how much straw Pharaoh would like to gather. But the thing is, what's so beautiful about this story is that Jethro, they, they, they hear about the stories. You will, after, when this is all over with, notice, just like in Micah 4, Micah says, I brought you home. I've delivered you, Israel. I brought you back. But now you're in travail as the old daughter of Zion that is in travail to bring forth. And he says, paraphrasing, but should I stop it? No, I did this in order to bring you forth. They went through trouble by the way, Moses said to Jethro. But God delivered them all of those troubles. He delivered them. Just like he will do now. Israel is, the, 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 now we're seeing Pharaoh do the sanctions. No, you can't have this. No, you can't have that. But then the two witnesses will step on the scene like Moses and Aaron, and they will begin to bring out the judgments of God. And as those judgments begin to come down, God will do his works. And then the children of Israel will be delivered. The way will be hard. But there will be deliverance from God Almighty. And then what will happen? Then when Israel is finally delivered and they're all past the Red Sea, they've come through it. And, and, and Pharaoh and his army is all dead. And we will gather together with the bride of Christ. And we will sit and they will listen as the stories are told about the great mighty works that God did for the children of Israel. And no doubt that Christian believers will share the mighty works that God did for them down through the ages. What a blessed time we're about to see. Oh, praise be to God. Wow. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all travail that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Right now Israel is under the bondage of Rome again like it was 2,000 years ago, and we need to be delivered. Remember, as I told you a little while back about Hadad? Hadad was the one son that was escaped the sword of David, who was what? A descendant of Esau. He was from the royal house. He's raised with Pharaoh and his house from a little child up, taught in the ways of the Egyptian gods. And then he, what does he do? When he becomes a man, he says, let me go out to my people. And he says, Pharaoh says, have I not given you everything? He says, yes, you have, Pharaoh. Like Moses, see? Remember the Antichrist is like Christ. Moses was the true type of Christ. Hadad, everything that happened with Moses. Moses was delivered. Notice, he says here, Moses says, because he said when he gave his son the name, Eleazar, that God is my helper, he says, because you delivered me from the, from the sword of Pharaoh. What was he talking about? When he was yet a youth and the Pharaoh sent out the, the decree to kill all the little children, the little boys. And God delivered him from that. God delivered Moses from that sword when he was yet a child. And now the hour is upon the world when the two witnesses are about to appear on the scene. But everything is working just right. There must be sanctions against Israel. Not that we would want them by no means, but the thing is, it's according to the way. See, he says, all that happened to you along the way, the way in Hebrew, the word is derch. In other words, in your road, the travel that you're making, all these things that happen to you, everything that's happening to Israel is for a reason. Israel must recognize that Israel is under the bondage. She's under the bondage of the Pharaoh of Rome. Because remember, Hadad, he was 
raised under Pharaoh, Esau's descendant. He goes into Syria, becomes the king of Syria. Then he goes from Syria, according to historical documentation, and goes into Rome, Italy. And then later, when Christianity, now there were true Christians in Rome, true believers, but then those little fake believers, those little false, little make-believers, you might want to call them, what happened there in Rome, then little Esau's descendants that wanted to take Christianity and they said, this is the way now we can trap the people. We'll make a little, we'll make a one world religion here. And anybody that doesn't agree with our doctrine will stomp them out. Why do you think the Catholic Church killed all the early Jews? In fact, uh, it was Rabbi Tovia Singer that said one time, he says, where are those early believers that followed Yeshua? Where are their descendants? They were murdered by Rome. They're trying to stop the gospel. But you have to understand the Holy Spirit is not a spirit that can be killed. So what happened? Kill off those early descendants if you so desire. It's not a bloodline now. It's a royal bloodline. It's by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so if you kill off this group here, God will just raise up another group filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what he's doing. He's raising up a bride. And he's also raising up Israel. And soon they will be filled with the same Holy Ghost that God gave you. Pray for us. Stand with us as the gospel moves forward. As we share the gospel not only to the Jewish brothers that we have and sisters, but as well as we try to share the gospel because we're here near Europe. I have to be in Europe here and there in Koshitsa here in November. In Australia. We ask you to be joined with us, support this work, to take the gospel of fires of revival anywhere we can to revive that bride that is sleeping. Remember, the Bible talks about they were sleeping among the dead. The dead is the Vatican groups and, and the churches that seem to have no life in it, but there's true believers everywhere. That tells me that there's true believers in the Catholic Church that just need to come out. They haven't woke up yet to who he is. There's other brothers and sisters out there as well preaching the gospel, trying to bring them out. God bless you. And as we hear so many times the things that are happening to the Christians down in, in, in the Arabic countries that are believers, you know, you may not realize this, but do you know, they talk about the men getting their heads cut off, but are they telling you about the women that are having their hearts cut out of their chest for the name of Yeshua? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I'm Stephen Bendenoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. We love you. God bless you. Visit our website, israelreturns.com. If you want to support this ministry, you can do so there. If you're wanting to mail something, if you would, don't do it quite yet. You can send us an email there. You can send it to contact at israelreturns.com. And then I can answer you there what to do. We are setting up a P.O. Box. Uh, Sister Lisa will be helping us with that in uh, in Florida there, because she's there close by us anyway. And uh, she works with us here in the ministry. So she'll be handling those that want to do that. Uh, and we're working on getting a post office box in Israel as well. So we'll be able to correspond that way. God bless you. I love you. My wife, our whole family, we love you. We thank you for all you do. And just pray for us. We're seeing wonderful things happen. God is always putting people in our path. And what a blessing it is. If you're in Europe, by the way, because I will be... Uh, in uh, Koshitsa in November. I'll actually be in, in, uh, in Europe uh, for several weeks during November as well because uh, I want to go, uh, we're, we're going to some of the Holocaust sites. If you're here in Europe and you'd like to get together and hold a, a, a meeting to bring other believers together or even people that don't know Yeshua as their Savior, contact us. You can write me at stephenbenoon at aol.com. That's Stephen, S-E-V-E-N, Benun, B-E-N-N-U-N -N at AOL.com. I always have that email address and, and we will get with you to see what we can do to put something together to bless people as much as we can. We love you. God bless you and pray for us. We will be praying for you. Shalom.